while it is a pleasure for me to again be before you, it is also a sad occasion because it's going to be the last uh, one, at least for a while. So tomorrow morning we're flying out back to Florida. Life resumes its course. But uh, we were very blessed to be with you this week. And as Pastor Joseph mentioned, yes, sometimes espousing a unique position exposes you to uh, controversies from both sides. For some people, you're not conservative enough. And for some people, you're not liberal enough. So you're going to get hit from both sides. But it is what I believe. And I presented to you some of the challenges that I have been having regarding this topic in the past 28 years since I started, first laid my eyes on this issue. It has been the passion of my life and uh, in terms of work, okay, there's other passions in my life too, don't get any wrong ideas about that. But in terms of work, it has been something that I really enjoy doing. And uh, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the series, I'm not a scientist. I am, however, a re researcher of truth. I am a pastor who likes to know things about science, and my studies are in the history and philosophy of science, historical theology. So that being said, here we are at the last presentation. We remember that for those of you who watched last night, and I'm certain that all of you watched last night, uh, we talked about the difficult issues for creationists or for people who believe in creation. We learned that there are things that we don't really have good answers to. Like, for example, some transitional fossils or hominid, fo hominid fossils or the, the deep age or the f order in the geologic column. Although those things are not as perfect as presented in textbooks, we still don't have good, self-consistent answers to those issues. And we need to learn to live with uncertainties. We will not have all the answers to all the questions that we have. But it is okay because nobody has. <clears throat> nobody has all the answers. So as I said, people who believe in creation don't have some good answers for some issues. However, I can live with those uncertainties because I believe that the science that we have today firmly establishes, although the scientific community does not agree with me, but that's my interpretation, I believe it firmly establishes that only intelligence can generate and develop information. We do not know of any natural processes capable of doing that. We only know that intelligence is capable of doing it. Of course, not everybody likes this conclusion, but I believe it's the right conclusion looking at the data. Now, people who believe in evolution, <clears throat> they feel so certain about it because there's good evidence for it in the geologic column and in paleontology. Even if they don't have all the answers to the method of evolution, as I said, I believe that the methods of evolution, mutation and natural selection, and all the other smaller uh, mechanisms don't really produce novel information. Yes, they are able to produce change and microevolution, but through loss of information. So, wherever side you're situated on, you will not have all the answers. And we need to learn to live with uncertainties and we need to search more and more and more for the truth. Now, you see, so far throughout the series, we talked about this evolution-creation um, dichotomy. Yeah? So controversy, I don't like to, be, to call it that way. But some people say, what if that is a false dichotomy? That is, what if there are not the only two options? Because being honest, we have to acknowledge that the majority of Christians today, both from uh, the Catholic Church and the mainland Protestant churches and some uh, evangelical churches, most of them believe in both, in creation and evolution. So most of them would believe something along the lines of what is called theistic evolution or evolutionary creation, which they're not quite the same. They're a bit different, but for our discussion today, they're the same thing. 
Okay, I, I can even put progressive creation there, which is very different than theistic evolution. But the idea is this. Most Christians believe that God used evolution as his method of creation. That's their belief. And it goes something along the line of this. God created the laws of nature and matter. Can we agree with that? Okay, I agree with that. God created matter at the beginning and the laws of nature. However, where we, at this point, we start to disagree with this position. I start with this to disagree. You might agree with it. That's fine. It's okay. And after that, he did not guide or intervene or act directly to cause any empirically detectable change in the natural behavior of matter until all living things had evolved by purely natural processes. Okay, so God started everything. He created the universe. He created the laws of nature. And somehow he ingrained in matter its qualities that would later have produced life. And he just stood and he watched. This is not deistic evolution. It's not the God who starts and leaves. Okay? It's a God who watches. Watches and waits for life to appear, <clears throat> for humans to appear, so that he can have a meaningful relationship with them. Now, there's many reasons for which people believe that. One of them, it's not necessarily the main reason, but one of the main reasons is, as explained by uh, Pope Francis, as you know, the Catholic Church is big on theistic evolution. They say this, he says this, when we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so. He created human beings and let them develop according to the internal laws that he gave to each one so they would reach their fulfillment. Furthermore, Pope Francis continues, and he says, God is not a magician, but a creator who brought everything to life. Evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation because evolution requires the creation of beings that evolve. Okay, so that's basically what a lot of people that believe in theistic evolution believe. God doesn't act directly. You look in the book of Genesis, if you read that uh, literally, you might run the risk of imagining God as being some sort of a magician who does miracles and ev everything happens. And, and we know, what's not said here is we know nature doesn't act that way doesn't behave that way. And this comes against the background of people who understand as miracle being miracles being incompatible with reality. Uh, let's look, for example, at what Rudolf Bultmann says about miracles. He said that at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, he says, it is impossible to use the electric light and the wireless, by that he meant the radio, and to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries, and at the same time to believe in the New Testament worlds of spirits and miracles. So because of this background, people look at the book of Genesis and say, yeah, we can't interpret that literally because that would make God a magician. And we know God is not a magician. But I would like to suggest to you a new way of thinking of miracles, miracles and the laws of nature. Normally, when people think of miracles of natural and supernatural, they view it like this. See, that's the natural world, and that's the supernatural world. They're completely separated from one another. We know the natural world to be uh, true, but the supernatural, who knows? Well, maybe that's true, maybe it isn't, but they're separate. Well, I would like to suggest to you a different interpretation of miracles that would help us understand why a literal reading of Genesis would not make God a magician. And God's direct intervention in nature would not make him a magician. You see, many people who believe in theistic evolution, they try to stay away from God's direct intervention in nature because that would somehow violate the laws of nature. So he creates the laws, allows nature to happen, and then he stays away because otherwise he will violate the laws of nature. But I care to suggest that it's not the case. And I'm going to use an example. Um, <clears throat> flight. Let's think of flight. Before the Wright brothers were able to develop flight, people were saying that objects heavier than air would never be able to fly. Until that time, they were able to fly with hot air balloons. Why? Because hot air is less dense 
than normal air, is less heavy, so goes up. But objects heavier than air are not able to fly. That's what they were saying. It would go against the law of gravity. Now, when they achieved flight, did they break the laws of nature? What did they do? What they did was this. They discovered another law of nature, and applying some of the principles of that, laws of na that law of nature, they were able to counteract the effects of the previous law. So they discovered the laws of aerodynamics, that air moves with different speeds over different surfaces. So if the surface is curved, the air moves slower, so there's lower pressure. There's higher pressure uh, uh, underneath, so the direction of movement is upwards. And they were thinking, huh, what if we try to use that and build a device that would fly? And they did it. So what happened? Until they discovered these laws of, term of aerodynamics, the effects of those laws, flying was a miracle. Because that's not possible. You can't fly an object heavier than air. But once they discovered it, then they realized that what, what would have seemed a miracle before was not a miracle anymore because they knew more laws. So at this point, their understanding of natural expanded. You see? So what I, what I care to suggest is that all the laws that we know is the natural world. And the laws that we do not know is what we now interpret as supernatural. I believe it was Isaac Asimov who said that a society, um, a very advanced, a very technologically advanced society is virtually indistinguishable from magic. Imagine people who don't know technology if they were to go to a superstore and have doors opening on them. For them would be magic. Imagine um, using the... Uh, phones to talk nowadays and see each other. Well, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when, when I was a kid, you used that rotary phone, you know, let alone having that phone in your pocket. So as science progresses, we discover more and more laws, and then more and more things which were previously thought of as supernatural, all of a sudden we think, oh, they're possible. I'm going to give you one more example, and then we move forward with this. We're going to apply this to our understanding of nature. Think about what alchemists were trying to do throughout the Middle Ages. They were trying to transform lead into gold. Yeah, that was the, the, the surge of philosophers to transform lead into gold. At one point, they realized it's not possible. So physicians after the 17th, 18th century were like, no, this is, this is magic. Only by magic would you be able to do that. It's not possible. However, we discovered the structure of the atom. And we discovered, not you and I, scientists, of course, we, we discovered that lead and gold are not that different. They're basically the same because all atoms are the same. They just differ in the number of particles, subatomic particles that they have in them. Hence, they're different chemical and physical properties. So now, it is theoretically possible to transform, and scientists have done it, lead into gold, into particle accelerators. Only it's very expensive. It would cost you millions of dollars for a very small amount. So it's not practical, but it's possible. We know how to do it, and we've done it. And all of a sudden, something that seemed like a miracle is not a miracle anymore. Our understanding of the supernatural expanded even further. So what I care to suggest is that everything God does is governed by His laws. His direct creation of matter is governed by His laws. We understand now from Einstein that ma energy and matter are interchangeable. You can transform matter into energy and energy into matter. We're more, we're more capable of transforming matter into energy in nuclear plants and nuclear bombs Energy into matter, it's more complicated, and we're not quite there yet. We're trying to, and we have had some limited success again in particle accelerators, but we don't know that. We're not very good at that yet. However, 
If God created the universe and the laws of the universe, he has mastery of everything. So when he creates matter out of nothing, there's a law that governs that. We just don't know it yet. But he, because he's a God, he knows it, and he has direct access to matter. He doesn't need technology to manipulate matter. We, as humans, we need technology to manipulate matter. He can do that through himself because he's God. So whatever act God is doing and has done in the book of Genesis, that was not a miracle from his point of view. It was his normal way of action, using the laws that he created to have effects in nature. And then a miracle would become something like this. A miracle involves, this is from C.A. Rowe, a miracle involves neither a suspension nor the violation of the laws of nature. What man can do on a limited scale, the creator of the universe must be able to affect. If man, without actually suspending any of the existence forces of the universe, can change their direction, combine them, or neutralize them by the superior energy of another, much more must God be able to do the same, as he is mightier and wiser. So you see, when you interpret the book of Genesis literally, that God actually did those things, that's not a breaking of, of the laws of nature. That's God acting according to the laws he created. It's just that we don't know those laws yet. As scientific knowledge progresses, we know more and more of the laws of God, and more of the things that seemed miracles and supernatural at one point seemed the natural world. I imagine that in heaven we will have access to all the laws of God, maybe not all at once, because God is our Father, and parents usually don't like to do their children's business. They like to let their children do the discovery because that's more fun. So I would imagine that in heaven, God will give us access to the laws of nature, but he'll say, okay, now you got to figure it out on your own. I'm not going to tell you because that's not fun. So in, in heaven, maybe we'll all get to be scientists. At this point, not, not so much. So how can we apply this now? If we apply this to theistic evolution, you don't have to, select, you don't have to choose evolution as God's method of creation because otherwise you would break the laws of nature. If God intervenes directly, he is acting according to his own laws, okay? So then, why don't I accept theistic evolution? Well, a lot of people, when I talk about that, would think that, well, you can't believe in theistic evolution because the Bible talks about something else. Yes, I agree, but you not also need to be aware of the fact that some people interpret the book of Genesis not literally, and that's a valid option. I don't agree with it, but that's a valid option. So the main reason for which I say theistic evolution is not very likely to be God's method of creation is because the very nature of evolution, in my interpretation, this is my interpretation, you might disagree with it, but that's fine, the very nature of evolution goes against the very core of God's nature. And I want to show to you from several texts in the Bible. Because the Bible presents us a God that, in my opinion, is different than a God who would use evolution as his method of creation. Evolution, the way we understand it today, is to be crudely put, survival of the fittest. Yes, you've heard about that, yeah? We talked about mutation and natural selection. In evolution, there's more offspring than resources, and some of them die, and only the fittest survive. Well, I see the Bible presents to me a God that is exactly the opposite. It's a God who is not on the side of the fittest. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3, you read, He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. You see, evolution is about who's the mightiest, who's the strongest, who's the fittest. Faith and the God that I see in the Bible is the God who goes and helps the, the lowest of humans, is the God of the weak, is the God of the outcast, 
and look at all the prophecies of the Old Testament. All the prophecies of the Old Testament are full of social justice. I know this is a loaded term and people get scared when they hear it. Oh, wokeness. Oh, liberals. Oh, whatever. I, I want us to go beyond that. Let's go to the spirit in which the prophecies are done. And the spirit of most of the prophecies of the Old Testament are take care of the weak. That's what the prophecies are. Most of the rebukes that God makes to the people of Israel is like, you don't, care. you don't take care of the orphan. You don't take care of the widow. You don't take care of women. You don't take care of your parents. You don't take care of your poor. That's what the Bible is all about, the prophecies. And I cannot believe that, a, and you can call it a, the argument for personal incredulity. I don't care. This is my interpretation. I see that this God is not compatible with this method. God is on the side of the weak. Why would he use a method of creation that would disfavor the weak and favor the strong? That's not the God that I see in the Bible. He says if a reed is weak, he'll not crush it. And if a, flickering, if a candle is just flickering, he'll not blow it out. He'll go and try to vent it so that it, the flame grows bigger. That's the God that we worship. We worship a God who takes care of even the lowest, the meekest, and the slowest, and the smallest of all of us. He's the God who cares for the disadvantaged. He's the God who, God who cares for the poor. Whoever you are, wherever you are, no matter how low you are, your God is with you and he tries to get you up from there. Think about the father and the parable of the father, which is not the parable of the prodigal son. It's the parable of the father. His son was terribly disobedient, but his father did not care about that. He wanted to receive him back into his arms. That is the God whom we worship. It is a God who helps everyone. So I cannot see this God using a method that would disfavor the very people that he favors throughout the Bible. And we have even more texts that talk about this. Not this one. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm hold on. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 to 29, God chose the, chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised thing and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. You see, this is the same principle. Go and search in the Bible and you will not see a God who favors the boastful. He loves the boastful. That's a different thing. Okay, So he loves everyone, even those who are boastful, even those who are strong. So he loves everyone, but he always favors the weak. So that's the God that we worship. I cannot see this God using a method of creation that disfavors his very chosen. It applies to the animal kingdom, it applies to the human kingdom, it applies to everything. That's the first thing for which I don't see evolution as being God's favorite method of creation. He's God. He could have created in any ways. Why would he choose a method that would kill, so to speak, so many life forms, so many beings, so many humans. And that's the second thing. Because evolution, in order to work, needs death. In a way, death is the engine of evolution. The weak need to die so that the strong, yeah, you might not agree with it, but generally put it, Somebody has to die. Those that are not fit need to die so that those that are fit can survive and pass their genome to their offspring and so on and so forth. And when I look in the Bible, I see death is the ultimate enemy. Death is not something that God would use. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the immortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where is death your victory? Oh, death is your sting. So, when you look at what God tries to achieve with humanity, to give them, as the Ecclesiastes says, 
the thought of immortality he put in our hearts, the fact that he wants us to live forever, again, I do not see God using as his method of creation something that is against his very nature. I do not see God using death where he's the God of life. Now, death does exist in this world, and it's something that I believe God did not intend. When that happened, it's a completely different thing. We have to talk about that theologically. But for God to intentionally use death as his method of creation, I see goes against the very core of the gospel. One last text about this. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When the perishable has been clothed with him, perishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come through. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. So because of that, I want to show to you now what I believe is a way to be faithful to science that we know, to the science that we know, and be faithful to the Bible that we know in the model which I call seven-day ecosphere creation. You've heard about young earth creation. You've heard about old earth creation and all that. I call this model seven-day ecosphere creation because there are only two choices. Either God created everything or everything came by chance. And I believe subjectively that it is more plausible that there's a person who exists through, every, through himself that created everything. So I believe option number one, God is the creator of everything. Now, the universe is vast and big and very complex. And we don't know exactly how God created the universe. So I see no incompatibility between a theistic version of the Big Bang and a literal, literal reading of Genesis 1. God may have very well created the universe by starting it from one point and letting it expand using the laws of nature. I don't believe this is against a literal reading of Genesis because Genesis does not talk about the universe. Remember how I used the concept of intentional ambiguity. That's why I believe in, in point number two, a theistic version of the Big Bang is compatible with the literal reading of Genesis 1. Intentional ambiguity. Going further, I believe that the intention of the biblical text is to be taken literal. People might disagree with that. That's fine. But I, I, that's what I believe the text says. It uses the same word that it uses for the genealogies, toledot, which means the genealogies, the story of the life of, which means the text intends to be taken literally. The way the, the way the word day is used there with an ordinal numeral and the fact that it says day and night, evening and morning. I know that there are parts in the Bible where the word days, day, yom, doesn't mean a 24-hour day. But in this context, it always means a 24-hour day. So I believe the text wants to be taken literally. God could have used any method of creation. A seven day is a very arbitrary decision from God. It doesn't serve him any purpose except maybe he wanted to teach us something and give us something. If he wanted to create the world directly, he could have done it like this. He didn't need seven days. He didn't need to create the day on the light on day, day one. It's like, okay, I'm going to wait now. And then sky on day two. Oh, I'm too tired. I'm going to wait until tomorrow. He didn't need that. So the fact that the Bible tells us he created in seven days, he chose to do that because he wanted to give us the Sabbath. If you're not Adventist like I am and you don't believe in the Sabbath, that's fine. We'll figure it out theologically later. But now let's just be honest with the text. The text shows to us that this is the gift of God to humanity. And as I said, the text allows for the sun, moon, and stars to already be present on day four because he can read, and on day four... God made the sun shine. He didn't make the sun to shine, but the sun that already was there, God made it shine. So you can read that. The syntax allows it. Um, <clears throat> then what did God create? What God created during the, the, the week of creation was the ecosphere. Atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere. He created the atmosphere that we have now with the gases that we have now. He created or made the water. He did not necessarily create the waters because you can see 
in verse 2 of Genesis says that the water was already on earth. So he made it suitable for life. And then he created all life on earth. We can still discuss about microscopic life, if that was present before cre the creation week. And that is still possible from the point of view of the Bible, because at that time, they didn't know of microscopic life forms. And from the point of view of the Bible, microscopic life forms are not life. So that's a different issue, but we can be open to that. The Bible doesn't talk about it. And then I come to some of the most controversial points when I don't accept evolution. And I say that evolution is not the correct description of the history of life because only intelligence has been proven to create and improve information, and microevolution has been proven to be limited. So my assessment that evolution is not the correct representation of the history of life is not based on faith. It is not because I believe Genesis 1 is, is literal that I reject evolution. But I, I'm going to do that later. First, I'm going to look at science without any trying to ignore my philosophical bias. And I'm going to look at science and say, what do ex experiments show? And so far, we have not been able to prove that natural events, natural phenomena can create information or improve information. Our experience so far has been that only intelligence can create information. You might well believe, well, in the future, we'll discover some. Okay, we'll talk then. But so far, <clears throat> I would like to hear this being said. We don't know how information appeared. Then, I just said why I don't believe theistic evolution to be the method that God used to create. Because it goes against his very core. God cares for the weak. No matter how weak you are, no matter at what point in life you are, no matter how low you are in life, God cares for you. And he wants to uplift you. If you're a candle that is flickering, ready to die out, God will not blow you out. God will come and fan your flame so that you shine brighter. A God like this could not have used a method that favors the bold and disfavors the weak. So I cannot, theologically, this is my philosophical, uh, this is my philosophical assessment. I can be wrong, and I'm open to, be, to discuss about that. But the way I read the Bible at this point, <clears throat> I don't see compatibility between my God, who loves everyone, especially the weak, and a God who would use evolution as his method of creation. But of course, I don't have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. So what we need to do is to learn to live with uncertainties and continuously ser be searching for the truth. Be always in search of truth. Always try to see what is the best representation of things in life. That's a risk because you might discover that you're wrong. But we have to have only allegiance to the truth. In my search, of the truth of origins, I know there are points in which I would have to give up my cherished ideas because some of them might be wrong. Even maybe some of what I've said here might be wrong. I was not convinced that till this point, but if I am convinced at what point, I'll have to give up my cherished ideas. As I said, what I want when we talk about origins, let's put both options on the table. Naturalistic evolution and an intelligence who creates life. Once we put both on the table, if you convince me that naturalistic evolution or theistic evolution is a better option, I'll take it. But since you discard intelligent design, so to speak, from the start, I don't want to accept your philosophical supposition first in order to believe in evolution. Put both options on the table and they will talk. But still, you might live without answers. Now, that being said, this is the model that I, I believe in at this point, seven-day ecosphere creation. That being said, I want to end with one story from the Bible that will teach us how to deal in these situations with people that are different than us. In the book of Luke, I'm going to stop moving. In the book of Luke, we see the disciples 
being angry after some of the uh, villagers did not accept their message and they were to Jesus and said, Lord, do you want to... Is this one? Do you want to... Do you want us to bring fire down from heaven to, to burn them because they don't agree with us? And we do that sometimes. Oh, he's an evolutionist. He doesn't have place in our church. He's from the evil. Oh, this guy's a creationist. He's so dumb. Or whatever. We describe people. Describe people. Well, here Jesus says, you have no idea what spirit moves you. Did I come to make people perish? Jesus says, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So Jesus is calling us to accept and love those that we don't agree with. There's a place in our church, brothers and sisters, for people who believe in creation. There's a place in our church for people who believe in evolution. I don't agree with them. I don't agree with their theology. <clears throat> but I know God loves everyone. And we have no right of casting people away because of their beliefs. We just have to be together, a family, and let God be God. Because honestly, you're not saved if you believe in creation or evolution. Okay, your soteriology needs to be adapted if you believe in theistic evolution. You'll need to redesign your the doctrine of sin and salvation, but you still believe in God and in Jesus Christ as, his, as your only Savior. I know if, if the Eastic evolutionists and evolutionary creationists like Denny Lamoureux, who believe with all their heart that Jesus Christ is their Savior, who am I to say that he's not going to be saved but only me because I believe in creation? I believe our church needs to move a step forward and stop judging people by what they believe. I believe we should have a church in which everyone has a place, irrespective of their belief. And let God be God. He will save whoever he wants. But us on this earth, we have the duty, as, God said, as Jesus said to his disciples, you should get to love everyone. This is how people will know you are my disciples. If you love those around you. Not just those that believe in creation, or those that believe in evolution, or those that believe in the, the, the two of them. God said... That's the only criteria. That's it. If you love one another, people will know you're my disciples. So if you are to forget everything I said this week, because I know there's a lot of intricate and complex con concepts. Remember this. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And we are called to do the same thing for him on this earth. Accept everyone. And allow everyone to be changed by the Spirit of God at their own pace. Let us not force people. Oh, you come to church, you should not be dressing this way. Because God doesn't want that. How do you know what God wants? Oh, you should not come to church, you should not sing that way. Because God doesn't want that. How do you know that? I know we like to know, we like to think that we know God's, God's uh, taste of music was Bach. And at the temple in, in, in Jerusalem, only Bach was played. We might be a little bit surprised by what kind of music was played at the temple in Jerusalem. So let's allow God to be God. And let us love everyone, irrespective of their taste in music, in dressing. We all need Jesus Christ in our life to be saved, brothers and sisters. We're all fallen people. Irrespective of our beliefs in creation or evolution, we need Jesus Christ to save us. So let us create a church that loves and welcomes everyone. And then God will save whoever he thinks is worthy to be saved. But as we love one another, we will be known as the disciples of Jesus. And people will say, I want to go to that church. I don't necessarily agree with what they believe, but I like the way they treat me. I want to go worship with the Laguna Niguel Church because they welcome me there and I feel like in a family. I want us to create this church culture that stops judging people. We, we have this default, you know, 
action. Whenever we see somebody, it's like, oh, I don't like his face. I don't like her dress. I don't like her earrings. I don't, whatever. What, who, who asked you? That's not important. The important thing is to say, come. You are a lost son or daughter of God, just like I am. And Jesus Christ is not calling us to bring fire down from heaven on the, on the unrepented, on the sinners. Jesus is calling us to go search for people who are lost, bring them into the family, love them, and allow God to change them at their own pace. I, praise that, I pray that we become such a church. And I pray, God, that every one of us here, myself included, would fight against our natural tendency to judge and reject people and to transform us into a family that accepts everyone, loves everyone, and brings everyone to Jesus Christ. Amen.